and then uh, and then we kind of go right into it. After that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, that's good. Manita, ¿cómo Hi, estás? I'm good. Nice to see you. Igual miento. <laughs> like your hat. Oh, querencia. That's dope, man. Yeah. Thank you. I like your hat, too. Thank you. ¿Cómo estás? Caliente, ¿no? Hi. How are you? Good, good. All right. We might melt, you know. Yo sé. Yeah. Sí, we might just... <laughs> <laughs> <You'll see. laughs> Esteban sent a text and he said he's almost here. So okay. <laughs> I'm watching where the camera is. I'm going to come right over here. And I'm going to say just really quickly, welcome to our virtual audience who is jumping on right now. And the program will be starting in just a moment. If you would like to participate, <clears throat> please. Um, type your questions into the Q&A feature and we will answer questions towards the end of the program. So welcome and thank you so much. I brought you my bio if you need it. Um, you know what, I had put one together from what you had sent me before okay. and I added a, just a tiny little bit to it. I love it. You're, no, you're welcome to. You can... And I gave it to, to Michelle, well, so she's gonna be introducing all of us. Yeah. I, 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 Either yeah, way, yeah. Now too. I mean, I could explain it to whomever's here. Can we could explain it four times? Are you ready to start? Not yet. Uh, uh, we're we waiting on a step on. Yeah. yeah. So, I can say something now. Where's Gina, Mira? Oh, That's your baby. Yeah, yeah. I, just Love wanna, you. I just want to welcome you sort of informally before we before we get started. Um, we're still waiting on some people, but my name is Karen. I'm the director of education here at the Milton Rogers Museum. And thank you for coming out today. What I wanted to let you know about is um, our museum is trying to get information about the arts and cultures in our community so that we can provide uh, more programming for the community and so we have some surveys back there there's a box so that they can go into oh, okay. and there's also a qr code for those of you that are familiar with those you can take it in your phone at it and then it gives you the survey online um and as part of an incentive uh because i know people who love filling out surveys but we are getting ready to have our annual um turquoise it's called this year turquoise and sky with the diamond it's our annual ball and fundraiser, but it's more of a party this year. Um, and it's at El Monte Sagrado. Anyway, if you turn in a survey or do it on the QR code, we'll give you um, a raffle ticket. You can put it in the container back there and we'll do a drawing at the end of the programming um, for two tickets to that event. Um, so you would just put your name on, on one, keep one and put the other one. And we'd appreciate your feedback. Um, it will help us with our future programs. Thank you. Sure. Well, that made it really quiet in here. Oh, <laughs> okay. quickly went to go look at the exhibit oh, yeah. I hadn't seen it yet. Uh -huh. So I want to go in probably <clears throat> afterward and yeah. take a look, but yeah. it's beautiful. Yeah, it turned out real nice. The, the concha is in the has to listen to the digital concha. I listened to a few of them actually. Yeah. Yeah. How are you? Thank you. 
Here, it must be really yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I don't know. Oh, I could only get <laughs> It's okay, you're at on time. It's okay, it's part of the Mexico. We went all over the place. I didn't send that to you. Oh, yeah. I, I, I put one together from, okay. yeah. Uh, we went all over the place, Puebla, Cuernavaca, at least for La Tzcala, uh, Mexico City. I've never and, been. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to make the connections, especially with Atlisco because of Atlisco in the South Valley. Oh, yeah. And La Tzcala because of La, La Tzcalteca Indians that came right. over. Right. They settled in Santa Fe. Yeah. I'm doing, no, thank and, you. Uh, in Barrio de Analco. Yeah. Right. Oh. And there's a Barrio de Analco in La Tzcala right. over in Mexico City. Yeah. yeah. So it was a oh, really interesting uh, connection, but oh. yeah, it was it was nice. interesting one. How beautiful! Yeah. You have to show me photos. Yeah, we got tons of photos. I'll send you the links and remind me. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it might all melt away. I know. <laughs> But Albuquerque is hotter. I'm just saying that's <laughs> Oh, I bet. Well, I'm glad I wore a hat <laughs> to be in company. Oh, yeah, yeah we're, we're all wearing right hats. Here, some really nice I was ones. not going to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you said outside, I thought it'll work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I know, I usually wear one, actually. It's in, it's in my truck. You know, it's a few steps away. <laughs> yeah, you might need one. Yeah, you know, it's <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, so it's going to be a conversation. Uh, so uh, it, it'll be fluid. Everybody's going to be talking. Okay, great. At the same time, yeah. At the same time, that's how we At do it. At the same time. <laughs> well, I mean, everyone's no, going to you know, kind of nice yeah. yeah. you know, interrupt each other as they need to. Or no. I know, I have to compete with some pretty nice hats. Did you call us up way back? No. <laughs> The audience is conversation. Oh, I know. Oh oh, Karia, you conversation. <laughs> All right. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started with the program. Um, if I could get everyone's attention uh, to the front. Thanks so much for being here. Um, it's really lovely to see everyone on a Sunday here at the museum. Uh, my name is Michelle Lantieri. I'm the Curator of Collections and Exhibitions here at the Melissa Rogers Museum. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for joining us, um, and I also wanted to honor the Tiwa people, the indigenous stewards of the lands um, in which we are. Um, so today is the fifth and final Following the Manito Trail panel program here at the museum. It's called Following the Manito Trail, Plactica, Poesia y Cuentos, an evening of conversation, poetry, and stories. And this series, this Humanities Discussion Series, is sponsored by the New Mexico Humanities Council. I um, want to extend a lot of gratitude to them to you know, allow us to be able to bring these wonderful speakers here uh, over the course of the exhibition. And so the exhibition here at the museum, I definitely encourage you, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, please have some time, take some time to go inside after the program. Um, it's on view through July 31st, which is a Sunday. Um, but I'm also really excited to announce that the exhibition is going to travel uh, to Los Luceros historic site in Alcalde. And so it's going to open there in late September, and it's going to be on view through September through spring 2023. Um, after that, the exhibition will travel to Santa Fe Community College, um, and it's going to be on view from July 2023 through October 23. Um, so we're very, very grateful to the Northern Rio Grande National Heritage Area for making this exhibition possible here and also its traveling locations. We, we couldn't have had this exhibition without the Northern Rio Grande National Heritage Area. They've just been the biggest supporters uh, for this project. 
Um, and so we're really pleased uh, to have our speakers here today. Um, Levi Romero is here uh, right next to me. Um, in the middle is Olivia Romo. Um, and at the end of the table is Esteban Raul, Rael Galvez. Um, and so we're excited about their critical discussion today that they're gonna be having uh, in a conversation format. Um, so let me go ahead and just mention one other thing. Um, we have a couple of questionnaires that we would really appreciate your feedback on. Um, it helps us with getting these kinds of grants uh, for following the Manito Trail and future projects. Um, so there's one in the back of the room that's just about this program. And then we also have an opportunity for you to um, contribute information about uh, your participation in the arts uh, here at Taos. So if you have a few minutes, uh, we'd love for you to be able to participate in those questionnaires. Um, the second one could get you two tickets to our gala party on August 6th. Um, so if you have interest in that, um, it's going to be a fun time and uh, hopefully that'll help. I encourage you to fill out the questionnaire. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce our speakers. So Levi Romero was selected as the inaugural New Mexico Poet Laureate in 2020 and New Mexico Centennial Poet in 2012. His most recent book is the co-edited anthology, Carencia, Reflections on the New Mexico Homeland. There it is. <laughs> um, his two collections of poetry are A Poetry of Remembrance, New and Rejected Works. Yeah, yeah. Like it. <laughs> Congratulations. And In the Gathering of Silence. Uh, <laughs> he is also the co-author of Sagrado, a photo poetics across the Chicano homeland. Romero is a bilingual poet whose language is immersed in the regional Manito dialect of northern New Mexico. He has co-directed two films on Ezequiel culture, uh, Benedicion del Agua, a short film based on a poem by Olivia Romo, who's with us today. And Going Home Homeless, a short documentary with Jessica Royball. Romero is also an associate professor in the Chicana and Chicano Studies Department at the University of New Mexico, where he directs the New Mexico Cultural Landscape Certificate Program. Romero is from the Embudo Valley of Northern New Mexico. And then uh, here we have Olivia Romo, and Olivia Romo is a poet and water rights activist from Taos. She earned her dual bachelor's degrees in English and Chicana and Chicano Studies from the University of New Mexico in 2015. In 2019, she was one of the featured storytellers at the 21st annual Taos Storytelling Festival. And before that, she was titled the New Mexico State Slam Poetry Champion in 2011. Congratulations. <laughs> Her published works are an oral history documentation and cookbook titled The Gift of Good Food that honors traditional recipes, people, and families who prepared them. Her poems were also published by the New York Times in the 2019 article, Work Songs of the Cowboy Poets. Olivia sits on the board of the Taos Somos Writers Organization, and there's a short film based on her poem, Benedicion del Agua, which was featured in the Western Folklife Center's Moving Rural Verse Project, and it was on water in the Southwest. That can be viewed on YouTube if you'd like to search that. Um, and lastly, uh, we have uh, Dr. Esteban Royal Galvez. And um, so Esteban is the son of a Borogero, uh, in northern Taos County. Uh, he earned his bachelor's in English literature at the University of California at Berkeley and his master's and PhD in American cultures at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, where he wrote an award-winning dissertation recovering the experiences and histories of American Indian slavery and the unique legacy and identity in northern New Mexico and southern Colorado. He has served as the Senior Vice President at the National Trust for Historic Preservation, Executive Director of the National Hispanic Cultural Center, and as the State Historian of New Mexico. He was also the Founding Director of the Manitos Memory Project. He is currently the CEO and President at Creative Strategies 360, and he was raised in Cuesta and Costilla. Uh, welcome, Ms. Devon. Thank you. Go ahead and 
to turn this over uh, to the speakers and poets here. Um, I hope that you enjoy this program and uh, we will take questions at the end um, from the audience here and the audience on Zoom. If you would like to take your questions into the Q&A, we will also address those at the end of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Santas y buenas tardes, les de Dios. Land and people acknowledgement. Gracias a Dios for the various spaces where we are blessed to live, work, and have our being. We honor the land and the indigenous communities that inspire our heritage, learning, and growth. As Trisha Martinez's dad says, we recognize and respect the blood, sweat, and tears that have gone into the land. The generations of those who come before us and all of their lived experiences and efforts to survive and prosper. We remain thankful for the beauty of the land and its resources and recognize the historic experiences and contributions that cultivated the distinction of our enriched culture and people. We acknowledge the ongoing efforts to sustain the cultural, spiritual, and geographical landscape that help us to encourage, educate, and build our community and future generations. I want to begin, first of all, by thanking uh, the New Mexico Humanities Council and the Melissa Rogers Museum, more uh, specifically Michelle Lanteri and Karen Sherton, for all the work that they've done to uh, put this exhibit together. So thank you so much. It's been a lot of work and um, it turned out to be a beautiful experience, beautiful exhibit. Who would have thought 10 years ago or maybe even longer than that? when I was uh, conceptualizing the idea that somebody should do a documentation on the Manitos, uh, that one day would be actually part of an exhibit. Mm -hmm. I also want to acknowledge uh, my Following the Manito Trail collaborators, Vanessa Fonseca Chavez, Trisha Martinez, Patricia Perea, and Jesus Villa, and all the contributors to the project for this exhibit, including Amy Montoya and Michelle Trujillo. Uh, Michelle is here today and um, uh, there's a wonderful uh, digital cuento that they did on a woman from Arroyo Seco, Atanquilina Pacheco, that is in the back room there. Make sure that you watch it. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit of the description of what the Following the Manito Trail project is about. And then with that, then we'll go into the discussion, the platica. Following the Manito Trail is an interdisciplinary ethnographic project that documents Hispanic New Mexican or Manito migration from New Mexico to different parts of the United States since the 1800s. Looking at the, main, at the many major migration corridors for Manito families, this project focuses on the driving factors for Manito migration and the exploration of notions of querencia, or how one establishes a sense of self and community through, through place. The migration of people from Northern New Mexico is an important history of how Northern New Mexicano culture spread out. Who were these people and how did their language, food, spiritual and religious traditions and social customs survive outside of their cultural environment? Manitos did not leave their credencias to go on vacation, but as a necessary act of survival. Wherever they went, they not only migrated, but they transplanted the culture of northern New Mexico. This exhibit presents Manito stories and histories of outward migrations and migrations of returns focusing on people from the Taos Valley. So with that, muchas gracias Esteban and Olivia for agreeing to be on this panel. Uh, it's an honor. Uh, I've known you both for quite some time now in different capacities. And, uh, but best of all, as amistades, as manitos, as hermanos and hermanas, no? so thank you for being here this, this afternoon. I, our idea for a panel presentation today is really to have a plática, just a conversation. Arresolana, uh, the other panels have been all just super amazing. Uh, their format has been is that one panelist presents for 30 minutes and then the other panelist presents and then there's a Q&A afterwards. But what we thought that we would do a little bit differently is that we would just have a general plática, a conversation, a dialogue, following the model by Dr. Tomas Atencio, which is El Oro del Barrio, which he states that Oro del Barrio is not discovered through scientific methods, but through dialogue. And Oro del Barrio is the people's treasures, their, their histories, their stories, their chistes. And so that's what we're going to do here this afternoon, right? And este calor, and esta calor. 
So I want to open up by um, just kind of, uh, you know, starting off with a question that we can all respond to, but in what ways do both of you remember hearing about Manito, Manita used to refer to people in the culture of New Mexico? When did you first hear that term Manito and Manita to refer to, to your cultura? Well, buenas, uh, okay, now it's on. <laughs> buenas tardes. Um, it's so good to be here, aquí en mi querencia. And I just want to say that the first time I really heard Manito's stories, and I want to be clear that I actually don't think, you know, my father or my parents or even my primos ever used, like, somos Manito. But it was a term that when you called somebody mana, mano, that there was this deep spiritual boundness that you connected with that person. That somos de la misma tierra, that we are the same cloth, the same fiber, you know, somos una colcha, no? And so that that's a beautiful exchange when you would see somebody as a manito. But the first story that I was ever told of the Manito Cultura here in Taos was for my father, who's here today. Bendiciones, my papa, all the beautiful stories. And you know, the, the Manito experience is one of transmigrant experiences, right? That our plebe left these beautiful montañas aquí in Taos to seguir la trabajo. And whether that was in La Papa or La Vitabel or, you know, in La Borreguera. But it was the people who stayed the people who persisted, who raised the babies, the mamas, who lived here to protect the, the language and the foods and the cultura. So when the men returned home, it was those people that allow us to come, still come home and return to those stories and to our querencia and to have a place to live and come back to. But the first stories I was ever told was that my, you know, my abuelo Alberto Romo and Lucia Casillas had a beautiful ranchito there in Ranchos de Taos. And those cuentos of their big milpa and having maíz and borreguitos and all the vitabels and beautiful foods that they could grow there off the Acequia del Monte. Okay, and if you're familiar with Taos, there's the tanque there in Rio Chiquito and the Rio Chiquito feeds that Acequia there. Um, but my grandfather had so much animales and food that people would come, los manitos, no? De donde quiera, de Dixon, de Arroyo Hondo, de todo partes de Colorado. And they would come and they would pick food together. And it was all a system of exchange and bartering. And so some of those first cuentos that I was ever told was, yeah, oh, you know, I don't remember his name. But he would come and we would exchange for food or he would come and bring rugs and other things that we didn't have. And it was those exchanges that we always were remembered as manito, manita, because we'd work together. And that camaraderie of working the water, working the land and being, you know, together. So I have just like a little, a little poesia that I want to say and then I'll pass it to you. Manito Esteban. And let's see if my papeles don't fly away, but if they do, it's because all the, the ancestors wanted to pick them up for me. <laughs> Entra, querido pasajero. ¿De dónde eres? ¿De qué familia eres? Uh, eres mi manito, no? Anda, vamos a sentar aquí en la resolana. Cuéntame sobre tu viaje. Today we gather to share the stories and reflections of the Manito experience, which are all epic poems, corridos and dichos, and some, like my Manito Levi has told, has told me, are just stories llena de locura, no? Don Quixote style, vagabonds, vagabundos, marineros, the squint-eyed, cabeza de papa, the papa pickers, the pachucos, peregrinos. But let's not forget that we built our homes, made our nests, shared the treasures of our inheritance, or disputed over the land. 
We have watched the rise and fall of the Rio Grande and wept when we couldn't irrigate from our acequias. We have roots, seeds, and children all along this sacred Manito Trail. I, want, I didn't want you to stop. <laughs> Buenas tardes, le de Dios. Um, me llamo Esteban Rael Galvez. I'm so honored to be here with you today and to uh, hold space with these two incredible um, spirits that bring words to, to our space. It rem immediately reminds me of one of my dear friends, Rena Swenzel, who used to say, wherever we go, we leave our breath behind us. And poetry is, and words that we share into work, into space is like breath. And um, so thank you both, it's such an honor. Um, to answer your question, um, the first time I heard the term, I, I, it's very much how Olivia just answered it. I don't remember necessarily her hearing that we are manitos. I don't remember that necessarily, but I, I remember the mano, right? I remember the visitas of our, uh, my mom and dad taking me to our, their, their kin, their cousins, their aunts or uncles. Um, in the village, I grew up in, in multiple villages of Taos County um, and right on the state line of Colorado. Um, ended up starting school in Costilla, going to some school in Cuesta, then went to school in San Luis. That's what it means to inhabit those borders as well. Literally, our ranch is right on the state line um, in, in Costilla. Um, but when we would go visit, people would greet each other with, ah, mano erineo, mano nora, como es estado? You know, that was the first time. So I remember those greetings, which um, um, resonated in terms of kinship and intimacy. The intimacy carried over for me because I left a different type of migration, but a migration nonetheless that I maybe will reflect on later because um, at the risk of being at a table of poet, poets, I also <laughs> write poetry, but not like them. But, but I, I may share some of those. Um, but when I went out into the world, I, I like Levi, I went to Manal, uh, a migration route for many manitos that go into school, and I, but I never came back. Um, at the age of 14, I left my village, and I... I um, I, even though I often say that my um, core values were born of these villages and I was of the multiple generations that stayed, as Olivia mentioned, um, and was raised there, I wanted to leave. Um, I often joke that I was never going to be the sheep um, rancher uh, that my father was. I, I joke, I think, that I used to lose the sheep in the water. Um, my dad would probably say, you're not really joking. He's not really joking. <laughs> I, but, I, but I also, um, as much as I love these places, I also don't want to romanticize them. And, and I, I, it's important for us to recognize that um, we are born from generations of trauma, which is why I've dedicated my life to recovering the stories of resilience, the opposite side of that. Um, but I, in spite of being born to parents of salt of the earth, I was surrounded by drugs, despair, poverty um, in those places. We, we are from villages that are some of the poorest in the nation. And, and, you know, it, we have to recognize that in, in terms of that. All of that to say that I left um, and wanted to leave because I was drawn to words. As my dad always said, um, you know, use words as a way out, mijo. Get out. Get out of here. Um, and, but my mom, who was close, even though my dad, rancher, farmer, and I'm fortunate to have my parents alive today at the age of 95, the 
you know, he would be out there today if it weren't the fact that he would be taking care of my mom. But she always had a different look at this. She said, use words as a way back in. And so that balance is from which I was born, but still using words. But out I went. And the second time I remember hearing the term mano was when I would encounter money those out in the world. Um, and it, it, one of my dearest friends, um, uh, David Quinto, you know, when we, when you see manitos out in the world and you're in different places, in different spaces, you recognize each other. There's something about the way you look, um, that there the way you move, the, the inflection of your voice that, that allows you to recognize one another. Maybe it's the way you purse your lips and point. Um, something, <laughs> but um, it, it, you could be um, mistaken maybe for someone on the Lakota reservation, of course, but it shows how complex our identity is formed from multiple um, convergences. And so when I would see um, others also in graduate school or law school or wherever the spaces I was embodying, we would recognize each other and refer to each other, Manito. Manito is like we saw each other, we saw it and held one another in spaces like DC and New Haven, wherever that was in the world. And so um, that's what I remember. I don't wanna to take too much space. No, that's great. And uh, I was jotting down some notes about what you both were saying, but uh, gosh, going back to when I, um, I just grew up hearing like both of you, the way people refer to each other and as mano or mana, right? Short for it, mano or mana. Uh, but one of the interesting <laughs> things that really brought it to my attention was a conversation that I had with an administrator in the English department at UNM. Uh, she was African-American from Los Angeles. And one day I was talking to her and I said, oh, um, we just see things in a different way. And she says, oh, I know about your people. You're the manitos. <laughs> And I said, how does Oak from Los Angeles know about the manitos? <laughs> and I said, Oak, how do you know about the manitos? And she said, well, when I was a little girl, sometimes I would go to the factories where my mom worked. And there was people from New Mexico that worked there, and they were referred to as the manitos. And uh, that was an uncommon story. The common story that I had heard prior to that was that they had been referred to as manitos in the agricultural fields by the Mexicanos from Mexico, who heard them referring to each other as mano or mana. And then they said, Esos son los manitos, right? So that's kind of how I began to really contemplate the term manito as to somebody from Los Angeles, uh, an African-American woman referring to us from Northern New Mexico as manitos. Um, in terms of returning or staying here, as you both mentioned, that not romanticizing it and the, you know, the challenges that it takes to survive and to stay behind, um, prior to, you know, around the 1960s, late 60s and early 70s, the mantra was sal si puedes, get out if you can. And then along comes the Chicano movement, the rural northern New Mexico Chicano movement spearheaded by people like Antonio Medina from Mora and Esteban Ariano and Facundo Valdez, Tomas Atencio and them, La Academia from Embudo. And the new mantra became quédate si puedes, stay if you can or come back if you can, which of course we is the struggle that we have ourselves, right? Is coming back or staying. But that mantra changed from sal si puedes, get out if you can, to stay if you can. Um, and then um, also just like the recognition, the mannerisms of manitos, I was walking in Guadalajara, Mexico of all places. And uh, it was a book fair way back, gosh, 20 some years ago. And I was walking down the street and I saw two young gentlemen uh, coming towards me. I was young myself then too. And um, they approached me and they said, Oiga, ¿de dónde es usted? And I said, del norte de Nuevo México. And one of them turns to the other one and he says, ves, te dije, see, I told you. And they recognized the manito me just the way that I was walking down the street. And it turns out that one of them was from Mora and he recognized the manito mannerisms in my walk. You know? and, uh, and so anyways, it's just exactly like what you guys are talking about. Now, going back to Manal, where Esteban and I both were just fortunate to have been able to attend a boarding school uh, in Albuquerque, which was essentially the Indian school version for Manitos from the villages of northern New Mexico. But um, 
my roommates and our friends, a lot of the kids that went to Manal were coming in from other states. It was a boarding school whose families were originally from northern New Mexico, but had migrated to Los Angeles or Denver or other places. So they were manitos on the trail who were our friends at Manal or our roommates. Uh, so that trail has always existed and it's always kind of brought us back home. The other one that I want to cite is uh, my grandfather, who was also a borreguero, uh, Juan Andres Romero from the Embudo Valley, who uh, spent his adult life as a sheep herder in Monte Vista, Colorado, which is where he actually passed away on the, uh, on the day that World War II ended. And there's a whole story behind that, but I won't go into it. Pero sigamos adelante con la plática. Um, my, my abuelito Juan Andres was a borreguero. Who in, in your families were on the Manito Trail? Um, well, the stories that I've heard is very, very beautiful cuentos is of my, I'll speak first on my father's side, is my great grandfather, Felipe Casillas. And he ran a band of sheep from Taos to Wyoming using the Kit Carson Trail. And just the beautiful stories um, that I've heard of, you know, his, his voyage, but also, um, you know, the stories of his return. And I can almost see him, even though I want to be very clear, I've never met him. But there he would sit under the portal and ranchos with my father and roll velvet cigarettes and tocar el tombe, singing Comanche songs and talking about his viaje and talking about the struggle also of this region. You know, there was a, a story, and I hope to one day turn it into a, a really long poem or a short story, but where in the early 1940s, there was this big snow that came in. And the snow was so bad that it trapped the familia in their casita and all the borreguitos se murieron. You know, it was just such a severe storm that, you know, talk about loss, right? And back in those days, you know, not a lot of the men, they didn't own the sheep, right? It was, you know, a partido system where they would give the hombres so many borregueras and then by the next spring you had to return so many fleeces and so many sheep uh, back to the patron. And so if you could imagine that in a time when that was all these people had, that it was a severe loss and tragedy for, for the familias. Um, but you know, those are those are beautiful cuentos that that I cherish so so deeply, and you know, hearing the songs every uh, every um, New Year when we dance with the Comanches and Ranchos and all of the primos, we you know pile up in the back of the truck and we're laughing and we're sharing you know chile and hot cocoa and it's the it's the songs of our antepasados that I know that my grandfather sung that bring me so much joy and so much reassurance of who I am and where I'm going, no matter where I'm going. Um, my grandma and grandpa on my mother's side, they always went to La Papa. Okay, so they would always, before they had a lot of children, they would also get in their truck and they would go to Colorado and then they would come back with their truck, llena de papa. And they would deliver every to their to their vecinos and to their familia. And my grandfather, Benito Valdez, who was from Costia, he has land there um, and beautiful. You see you mountain, you know, and depending on who you talk to, there's a lot of brujeria or a lot of magic. <laughs> so, but the Rio Costia and it runs right, right through there. And that was old um, uh, land grant land from the Rio Costia Land Grant Association. Um, but my grandfather, when he moved to, he was born in Raton, but when he moved to Costilla, he raised some of his, his children there. And that's where my mom was born. And then they would also make their viaje to the Papa. And always, even in Arizona, when my father, when my grandfather moved to Arizona, there's always these cuentos that he, I mean, it was a part of who he was. He would go to the fields or, or he would travel far and he would pick oranges or he'd pick fruta and he would just come. And that was a part of his bendición. Right. That was a part of just something he always carried with him was the cambalache. That's what we call, right? A long time ago when we would actually pick food together in community. And those were some beautiful, beautiful stories that, um, you know, that I, I carried with me about Manita and Manito. Um, 
And it's interesting because, you know, I, I think um, I think about what you said, Esteban, is that, you know, it's not all romantic and it's not. And, you know, for me, you know, as a young Pasenia, um, my family disputed over the land and I never retained any land to irrigate or to farm here in Taos. And so I too am on my Manito journey. And this is my journey to come home, right? The spiral of us coming out and going into the world and offering what all the raices and all the seeds that were given to me and hopefully to one back spiral back and be home in Taos with all of you beautiful people to live the rest of my days, you know? Um, but in that journey, there was a lot of heartbreak, right? Because I was one of the few grandchildren or primos que quería quedar aquí. You know, I, if it was up to me, I would I would have lived here and stayed here and planted corn. Hell, if I wanted to go to the university or hell, if I wanted to go work for the gobierno, which I do now, right? Part of my my commitment to making a living, right, is is that is that viaje. And so as a young person, I I think a lot about what it means is the contemporary Manito experience. I interviewed my comadre Maria Gallegos and she's from Puerto de Luna. And she now had to move to Albuquerque, you know, for work. And she now works for the city of Albuquerque. And she tells me, Manita, every day when I come into my office and it depends what day I wake up. If I wake up my, when my medias revés, she says, I put my, my botas on and I trudge into my office and I know I have a job to do today. But there at her desk, she has her, her, her offering, the water from her acequia and her maíz always is a way to ground her whenever she takes her work, you know, whenever she goes into the office. And so for her, even though she had to leave Puerto de Luna, Right, she says, I always carry who I am with me in her trenzas mm. and her beautiful black braids of her protection, you know, and the stories of her, of her papa. And she tells me, yeah, these are, even though I'm not living there no more, this is the stories that I carry. Um, so I'll, I'll pass the mic, but I do have a poem that talks about kind of some of the challenges, right, that many of us are either displaced or on our journey or on our trail. And the journey is always to honor home. The journey is to remember where you're from. And along the way, you always run into your money. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. I always want to just pause <laughs> after you speak. Um, Levi, to answer your question, just thinking about um, those stories that we heard about uh, Manitos and the migration trail and the multiple trails. Part of it is my training as a historian. I, I think um, in historic time um, of that, but it's so all just say a word about that before I reflect on the personal. I, you know, I, you know, migration and movement upon land is something that is endemic to the human condition, right? And and it's, it's part of what we do and for different reasons. So even as we start to track why people left, what are the push and pull factors that pull people away? Again, you know, most of us trained in their era, you know, just earlier, it's part of the Chicano movement, those recovery. We're also trained in, in, in diaspora studies, right? Um, to think of immigrants, the Mexico or, or other immigrants moving across the world um, and not necessarily seeing uh, the manitos in terms of that word diaspora. Um, but we used it in terms of the Manito Community Memory Project because it seemed fitting, right? Because you create diaspora out there. Um, it, that is, you find each other, you create a sense of community, and you are essentially creating diaspora communities, whether in Utah, Wyoming, California, wherever. I, but as, as I was driving over today and thinking of this, I thought like, well, you know, if we, if we reveal the complexity of our identity in New Mexico, we recognize, we should recognize, I believe, that complexity and all of what it means. Um, there's been a tremendous emphasis um, in the past 100 years in terms of those migrations 
across ocean, right? Um, but I, I, I spent most of my life um, recovering a, a different diaspora in terms of um, uh, our indigenous identity and, and certainly how that gets couched in, in slavery. That's my major project now that I'm working on. But um, I, when, they, when they revealed the finding of, of footprints that revealed uh, migrations and movements, uh, 23,000 years ago. That is part, of, in, in the southern part of our state, those two are our ancestors and they were moving, they were moving. And the fact that they're like generations depicted in those footprints, um, a mother maybe carrying a little ch child, putting the child down for a little bit. I just like, that blows me away. 23,000 years ago, right? And so, I think way back. <laughs> but I also think of um, an ancestor of mine. I mean, so um, a, a man by the name of Antonio Jose Moya, born in the 1770s in Abiquiu. He, he gets onto the old Spanish trail and ends up moving with his sons, his sons, I think, at least one son, into Los Angeles. He is buried in 1848. I mean, think of the, the date and the importance of that date in terms of U.S. conquest. Um, that man who is born here in Abiquiu ends up in Los Angeles as part of a whole contingency of Nuevo Mexicanos who end up part of the founding of, of Los Angeles, even before 1848, obviously. And so his daughter, um, is the one that stays in Abiquiu, marries into the Rael family. They end up continuing to populate Abiquiu and moving into Cuesta. Um, so she's one of the ones in all of her generations up to me stay. Um, I, I think of all of those individuals who end up moving to um, Colorado because of the industrial um, factory work into places like Pueblo. Um, to this day, who continue to get sick because of those movements, right? Um, but ended, I have great uncles and aunts that ended up in Pueblo. All of the Galveses from Postilla ended up, except my grandfather, ended up moving into Denver, all of his sisters. So, and I think about their identity, how different from my identity, but, but how it starts to be shaped. Um, if you haven't all read the an incredible book by Callie Fajardo Einstein, which is getting to be a bestseller, Women of Light. It is precisely a novel reflecting about her ancestors who end up moving to Denver and navigating through those streets in an urban setting in 1937. Meanwhile, like my family was in the 1930s. Um, and so just there's multiple, multiple stories, even, even people who, as we were talking about the other day, Levi, who go, but for a temporary period during the interwar years into places like Los Angeles, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, into uh, Oakland or Los Angeles to work the shipyards, but then came back. There are people that go and never come back. There are people that go and want to always come back year after year for the peace. So it, it, it varies in our families. So let me backtrack a little bit on uh, what you both have been talking about. Um, I'll begin first of all with, with, with U.S. Demon and I'll move down to Olivia. But um, this idea of the diaspora, right? The people leaving their credencia. Credencia, what my 94 year old primo in Dixon explained to me. A few years ago, before I had actually started working on the concept of Terencia, was este es mi Terencia, primo, aquí es mi Terencia, el lugar donde naciste, el lugar donde te criaste. So that is the traditional term in northern New Mexico for Terencia, is the place where you're born and raised. You have to remember that years ago, my primo's generation, they were raised to the same home in which they were born. Right, and now of course, Cadencia is entirely different. It's just the, it can be the place, not necessarily where you're born, but the place where you feel safe, where you feel you belong, where you feel at home, and that can take on all kinds of different forms, right, Cadencia. But that was how my primo explained it to me. And so my tios and my tios from Dixon, they wound up in, in San Jose, California, in the 50s, 
working in the canneries. And there was a whole group of other Manitos from that area, of the Dixon and Pudo area, that also migrated to San Jose that also worked in those canneries. Um, and then stories that I've heard about people from Taos migrating to Oakland, as you mentioned, that referred to the communities that they settled in Oakland as little towns. I'll say he was living there, right? Just like the Chihuahuenses that come up north from Chihuahua and settle in the South Valley in Albuquerque, they transplant their culture within their language, their foods, their traditions, their customs, their worldview, exactly like what Manitos have done wherever they've traveled, wherever they've gone. Uh, speaking of migration in 23,000 years, you know, that's a long time ago. But uh, I just got back from a, a, a study abroad class to Mexico, and we were in Puebla and Tlaxcala in a police school. And those two places, Tlaxcala and a police school, had a certain uh, interest for me because the Tlaxcalteca Indians, as, as you know, they came up with Oñate. They were the ones that knew how to construct the, 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 uh, the beaches, right? And how to build the, 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 the structures, etc. They were the workers, not the soldiers. And so uh, when I was in Las Palas, I wanted to identify if there were still ditches there. And of course, there aren't any ditches there any longer. They're all underground now in, in canals and stuff like that. But also at police school, um, at police school in the South Valley of Albuquerque is named after a police school from Mexico. And there, it's a, it's a very rural area, very agricultural, very agrarian. You do see a second there in a sequel. But that's part of the migration pattern that those people coming up in Camino Real, as far as Taos, would have settled here and not gone back. So it could very well be that the people in this audience who are from Taos, like us, you know, like you, are Zapatecas or people from a Tlisco, you know, Ken you know. But uh, part of the, uh, you mentioned the, the the work that you've been doing around the, the, the slavery and uh, i wanted to cite uh, uh, a really wonderful book that just came out a couple years ago by enrique la madrid and moises gonzalez called nacion genisara which is about the genisaros and uh, indian slavery in, in northern new mexico um the spanish trail is also of interest to me because my my on my paternal side of the family the atencios they went all the way to California, San Francisco, and Los Angeles, leaving from Abiquiu to sell horses to the military in California. Way back whenever that was, right? That's part of the, the history in my family. Can you imagine that? Even by today's standards, it's far just to drive over there. But they went and they delivered horses to the military in Los Angeles and San Francisco. The Atencios as part of the Spanish trail. Another settlement in California that most people don't know that was settled by New Orleans was Chavez Ravine in Los Angeles, which eventually the people from Chavez Ravine were displaced to make room for Dodge Stadium. Right? But it was the Chavez's from here from New Mexico and Abiquiu that settled Chavez Ravine in California. Um, and then moving uh, on to you, Olivia, when you say that you never met your grandfather, that sparks uh, a thought in me because I never met either of my grandparents, my grandfathers either. I met my grandmother. Uh, both of them passed away when I was one of them was in San Diego when I was eleven. But I never met my grandfathers. And I was walking through the Campo Santo in Dixon one day, and I came up headstone, and in the headstone it said "loving father," but it didn't say "loving grandfather." It said loving husband and loving father, but not grandfather. How come he's not acknowledged as a grandfather? That's my grandpa, you know, who I carry with me to the very present moment. And what it was is that an uncle had decided that what he would do before he passed away is that he would, you know, pay for headstones to be done for all the family members who had passed away already. It was my grandfather, but he didn't recognize the grandchildren. My grandfather had passed away before he had any grandchildren, but we we're still his grandchildren, whether we met him or not, you know. And so it reminded me of that, of my my grandpa, who is my grandpa, even though I didn't meet him. Um, and then you also mentioned about um, that uh, the migration to Borregueros, right, and how they were taking care of other people's borregas because they were no longer their own. And I say no longer their own because and Esteban can probably really speak to this. But it, essentially, when it first started out, is that all these borregueros from here own their own borregas. 
And then it was like families like the Bond family in Española that owned the ownership of the ranchos and the borregas. And then so these borregueros wound up taking care of the sheep that had once belonged to them for the new sheep owners that now they work for one of them in Española. I don't know if you know anything about that. Is anyone or you want to say something in that regard? Show you. I'm, I'm trying to remember right there. There's a saying that my dad has about one of the patrones from here in, in Taos who was named McCarty, right? And there was a there's a saying actually in terms of you know, if if I could text my dad, but he can't text. <laughs> um, I can ask him, right? But because he he actually talks about that precise level of of um peonage and uh and um different class systems that end up creating a, a sense of dependence um, in our valley that that led to part a lot of these migrations right because they lose so much of their partido they're indebted it, it, at different levels and there were different patrones in different locales certainly bond and i'm pretty sure it was pretty here in, in taos um that that creates that level of dependence that leads to um migrations out, out into these urban settings in which they're also dependent right um but even as you were just reflecting i know it's slightly different Levi, about the grandfather not known I'm always thinking of the grandmothers who are left behind, particularly those women who were uh, married to Borregueros who were going out to Utah or Wyoming. And there's a wonderful book that has become a standard and it's now dated to like maybe the 1990s. I don't remember Sar Sally Deutsch, Sarah Deutsch, No Separate Refuge. It's all about the women who stay behind in all of these villages and what that means in terms of the the relationships that get formed and broken in the migrations as well. Um, complicated, beautiful, joyous, sorrowful, all of those things. Yeah. I know that's slightly different it's from a, what you asked. It's a topic that we, we don't follow a trajectory here. We're, we're all over the place, but we bring it back. Right. And the wind moves us back. <laughs> I keep thinking that when the microphones, uh, you know, when you do that, that is thunder. Well, since we're talking about the Borregueros, I have this really cool, uh, it's, um, it doesn't fly away. Um, but when I, you know, I worked, uh, you know, in the Sekia world for many years. And that allowed me to travel and go to these very beautiful rural communities where people were farming and irrigating, even with all the climate change. But one community that really, really moved me uh, with a bunch of manitos, with a very unique manito experience, is out toward Gallup and Grants. And in those communities, there was big borreguero uh, operations. And the Lebanese community was there in Cebolleta. And we also had um, the Lascos who, who were living there. So there was a, a different kind of cultural experience in that community where, whether it was the Patrones or even some of the local community um, land grant areas from San Rafael and um, San Mateo. And they have these beautiful sheep and cattle stories. And, you know, um, I'll touch on two things is one of the Manito being an experience of beautiful stories and living off the land and working together, and also one of discrimination. So when I went and I met with one of the elders there, you know, I'm from Taos and I'm pretty fair complected, but I was doing a oral, an oral history documentation of the community to help document the water rights there in San Rafael. And there was an old bar there, and at the bar it was called Palomas. If anybody's familiar with San Rafael, it's this little hole in the wall, right? It's still, it's still there. And there was an elder there who has the stories of when that they would actually do the repartamiento with the acequias at Acama, because that's on the fence line of Acama Pueblo, but there was a lot of water sharing at that time. And these beautiful ojitos and 
these people would come from all over to work the land, right? Um, you know, the, the buckaroos and all the, the cowboys and all the uh, sheep herders. And I remember when I went into the bar to start asking him questions and interviewing him, he was very, very rude to me. And I came in and I said, you know, te quiero preguntar de, de lo manito aquí, you know, de San Rafael. And then he said, ¿Quién eres tú? Gacha, me dijo. And he said, tú no más hablas como los pachucos. And he didn't want to, he didn't want to interview with me because he didn't trust me. And I said, ¿Y tú viejito? ¿Qué? Pero me entiendes, no? Sí, you know, yo hablo como lo pachuco, pero me entiendes, no? Sí, sí, te entiendo. I said, well, then let's talk. I'm, you know, let's, vamos a hablar, you know? Soy tu manita. But, you know, interesting story. So anyway, he passed on these beautiful, these ballads to me. And it was of a, of a cowboy there in San Rafael in the early 30s and 40s. And his name is Hamp Evies. And I'm going to read you a ballad. Hamp Evies. And maybe that was even his nickname, you know, who knows? But the title of his ballad is Why Cowboys Turn to Sheep Herders. There was a heck of a great big snow in 1931. I'm here to let you ladies know it was one son of a gun. We had rounded up the cattle to take the calves to Grants. The wind came rustling across the flats and right on through our pants. The next morning, November 22nd, the, bo the boss called us out at four. I wished that I was home at Pa, I would never punch cows no more. We wrapped our feet in gunny sacks or anything we could find. The, where the trails, oh, excuse me, hold on. We wrapped our feet in gunny sacks or anything we could find. The boss let out a rattling thread, we strung out all behind. Cross his ditches and arroyos where the trails were mighty steep. The snow kept on piling up already two feet deep. The boss sang out to Telesford through the storm was raging high. Do you think we can get around those doggies up? He said, well, we'll try. We cut the herd and got them penned. The snow was plenty deep. We got a bite of supper and then a wink of sleep. Next morning, just at break of day, we were up and around about. We had to chop the corral fence down to get the cattle out. We worked the cattle and mud deep and mud knee deep. And on the roundup goes, it was so gosh mighty cold, cold, Alcario froze his toes. We got down to the ranch next day and got out of the storm. We fed the cattle in the shed. Oh boy, that ranch was mighty warm. We got down to Grants all right, and everything was fine until we started to cross the track. Here comes old number nine. It stopped right at the crossing and there it blew and blew. The calves had never seen a train, so up the hill they flew. We pursued them with great vigor and finally gained the lead. But I'll have to let you know those doggies were running at full speed. Over the rocks and holes and fences, twas so dark you couldn't see. But at last we got them milling right near the letter G. We got them penned at nine o'clock and was we glad, oh gee. And we had Thanksgiving there with Big Boss, Senator Lee. So Mr. Evie's had some really great stories. Messing up the mic, I'm sorry. I'll try to speak a little further away. Um, but there was all these beautiful uh, ballads and songs that came out of the sheep herders and the cattle. And again, you know, reminding folks of the, the loss of land that many of these people experienced, you know, those land grant Aseca communities are really, really special. And um, they turned hands when the federal government took over a lot of those, um, of those land grants. And ultimately there was a few key uh, stakeholders, the patrones from there that owned the land. And then a lot of the people they employed so, you know, the heaviness of, of that being your querencia and then you having to work the land like a peon or a slave. And so there was a lot of heaviness in that valley around, like, well, this is our querencia, this is our home. And these great stories of these people moving into that region, leaving and staying. And, and furthermore, people staying and having to go work at the coal plant. You know, there was, that was when the uranium boom really happened in that region. And so those same manitos 
having to leave their their mipas to go work in the coal mines and also at the uranium mines and many who left to go seek work elsewhere um so that was one poem that i wanted to share about the sheep herders and the cattlemen from out in that area did you have another question or should we do uh, more I, I, I wanted to follow up if, if it's okay a with a, a poem on not a mine, but uh, taken from a collection of poesia from an anthology put together by Anselmo Ariano, que en paz descanse, passed away a few months ago, but uh, the anthology is entitled Los Pobladores Nuevo Mexicanos y su poesia, 1880-1950. Um, it really is a treasure to have that book. Este poema se intitula Las Penas de los Metabeleros. And it's all in Spanish. I don't have a translation for it. That's not saying I apologize. <laughs> para empezar estos versos, pongo mi atención primero para contarles, amigos, la vida de un metabelero. Nos levantamos muy tempranito, nos empezamos a estirar. Cuando salemos al frío, empezamos a temblar. Cuando llegamos al field, agarramos los machetes con la única esperanza de alcanzarnos buen cheque. El petabel es penoso, no se le puede negar. Llegamos en la tarde, no podemos ni cenar. Los que salen cansados y son débiles de mente, parece que se han echado sus tragos de aguadiente. El que no lo quiere creer, que pase a Colorado, aquí no es Nuevo México para andar de enamorado. Les digo a los muchachos, los que nunca han trabajado, si quieren saber de penas, que pasen a Colorado. En Nuevo México no trabajan duro ni andan a pantalones. En Colorado ni se polvean ni andan de vacilones. Les encargo a los viejitos no vendan sus ranchitos para venirse a Colorado a rodar como palitos. El que compuso estos versos, su nombre se les va a dar. Es Mague Sánchez de Holman. Lo deben de dispensar. 15 de octubre, 1931, 1931, when that was written. And it follows the, the standard form of poetry, right? The AB, AB rhyme scheme and the quatrain, right? It's a quatrain. Um, and it really shows what a sheep herder, how literate they were too, because the misconception about all main panels is that we have a really wonderful, great oral storytelling tradition which we do, but that we're not literate, that we're not writers. And uh, Ariano's book dispels that myth, right? With all that collection of, of poesia by these borregueros in the 1930s and the 20s who were out there in Los Campos writing amazing poetry. I know, I take that almost as an invitation to actually share a poem from the 1934. Um, yeah. that, uh, that, so it was, different ways in which these were being collected. And one way was the newspapers, right? So the editors of these newspapers were actually capturing um, these migrations in different ways. And I called this, so I have this section uh, on the Manitos blog, manitos.net, um, where I just titled it, Director's um, Journal that I titled it Versitos Caminantes. And it was written in 1934 by Max Martinez. Um, he reveals in the verse, it's also in Spanish, but a verse of the migrations that he has taken. First noting that he was born in Cañones. After that, he writes his previous residence was Frutita, Frutita, Colorado. And by the time he's writing, he's living in Cisco, Utah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and exactly as Levi was just saying, it counters this notion that we weren't literate. 
right? That we weren't even in, in places. It's easier for us now to write. We can pick up our phone and we can write, but in those times it was much harder. And this poem is actually about the writing tradition itself. Um, so, La Lira Neo Mexicana. No sé si por unos días tomé el lápiz en mi mano y el papel sobre la mesa para componer estos versos. De repente y muy a prisa, porque recibí una carta del honorable director, pues quiere que yo le diga mi residencia anterior. Mi residencia anterior era en Frutilla, Colorado, pero como soy trabajador, ahora he cambiado de estado. Ahora resido en Cisco, mis cobros todos los días. No sé si por el invierno, no sé si por unos días. Dispense la elección. Oiga, señor editor, pues no, no le había abandonado este año mi suscripción. Making sure that he knows I still pay for my subscription, in, which is lovely. Pues síganmelo, síganmelo, man, man, mandando para componer versitos para que salgan publicaciones en el nuevo mexicano, en el nuevo me mexicanito, en el placita de cañones donde fui nacido y criado, todos los días me acuerdo de ese cerrito mentado. Ya con este me despido, oiga nuevo mexicano, a la vuelta de correo te espero ver en mis manos. Max A. Martínez de Cisco, Utah. Cuando dices lápiz en mi mano, me recuerda de lo que decía mi papá. Denme mi lápiz y mi leva, y yo la hago en cualquier tierra. And um, speaking of collections of, uh, of newspapers, uh, Dr. Gabriel Menendez has a book just dedicated to that. Um, Dr. Trisha Martinez, one of the collaborators, one of our collaborators on the Monito Run, uh, is right here in the audience. Uh, hello, Trisha. Did you know Dr. Melendez's title of, of, of the book that he did on newspapers by any chance? It's a, yeah, I don't either, but it's another great collection from it, all on Spanish language newspapers in New Mexico. So, sigamos adelante con la plática. So, what I'd like to do is break a little bit from form here today. Um, and so, what we tend to usually do is wait until the end for the Q&A. But since this is a plática and there's not a Socratic figure over here at the front, meaning that we're all Socratic figures. And so, I'd like to invite you at this moment to... Uh, if you have any comments or questions, uh, we're free to uh, answer any of questions or respond to your comments. If anybody in the audience would like to uh, partake in this plática, let's not wait until the end. So, uh, está bien. Uh, any questions, comments from anybody? Por favor. I want to note that uh, a lot of the Manito trails, some of them are long and some of them are short. Both in time. Absolutely, uh, and that's something that you were alluding to earlier, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I thank you for that comment, and that's exactly true. And, and I, I think it's short in time and space. I mean, they can go up and see my set of his grandfather that went to Monte Vista, or I mean, there are manitos that are in New Zealand, right? This is one of the things that we discovered in the Facebook group for Costilla is that, I mean, Costilla today is a village of about 79 people. Um, and 
And yet that Facebook group is, I don't know, like 3,000 people. Who are they? They're those people that live all over the world. Um, and they're their kids. And, and some people have different relationships with this querencia. Some make the querencia where they go, carrying it their home, like a little turtle shell on their back. And they make their villages in those urban centers, in, wherever in Los, in Los Angeles, in Salt Lake, in Denver. Um, and, and, and some never want to come back, right? And sometimes coming back, for their kids or their grandkids. And, and so it just varies uh, across our communities and our families. I know family members who are completely broken off from being um, connected to this place. And I know that their grandchildren want only to come back and make their way here. So it's we have to recognize and create space for all of those experiences and relationships in our landscape. And it's so easy to actually um, become gatekeepers of identity within that realm, right? Because I have cousins that talk like y'all, right? Like they use those terms like that because they were raised in Texas. And it seems so foreign to me. And it seems so different. And I, I can't relate to them. They don't look like me or they don't look like people from here. But yet, they want to belong, right? And, and it's a reminder to me that we have to create spaces even for people like that, right? Particularly if they want to, right? If they want to reassociate themselves. If you think about that in terms of the identity of our primos who, who left and are in other places? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, my primos uh, who grew up uh, in Athos, California, for example, just outside of San Francisco, and then my other primos who grew up in San Jose, uh, one on my maternal side, one on my paternal side. And it's interesting, the, the, the difference in the two, because one was uh, grew up in a very traditional Nuevo Mexicano family away from home, and another one that had evolved pretty much into a uh, San Franciscan familia. My uncle used to say, I'm a San Franciscan, I'm a New, I'm a New Mexico. I'm a San Franciscan born in New Mexico. And, and he was a judge, a retired judge in, uh, in, uh, in Palo Alto, California. Whereas my other tío, Celestino Duran, he was a, a landscaper. He had his own landscaping business, but he grew, raised his kids to be more traditional than the New Mexican way. And just the difference in the two, right? But they were both families, you know, so different than us growing up in, in, in Dixon, you know. And uh, go, going back to what you were saying about Albuquerque, even I'm glad you mentioned that because we don't even have to leave home anymore to feel like we're away now because the world has come to us, to Taos and to Dixon, right? I mean, Dixon, when you go into the, the middle of the village and the little general store there, you could be in uh, Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's just that the world has come to us now. We don't even have to be on the Manito Trail anymore. But I live in Albuquerque now. But for me, when I leave the Canyon, as I leave the Canyon, as I'm leaving the Canyon and I get into Velarde, that's like leaving the womb for me. That's my tenencia. And I know that I'm now entering into a whole other world when I'm leaving the cañon. Olivia. I love that. Just to go off what Manuel Carlos was saying, I, I had a quick platica with my comadrita, uh, Laura Manzanares, who's a beautiful folk singer from Tierra Maria and has a very unique Manita experience in which her bisabuelo was from New Zealand and had this background in moving sheep, and that's, uh, you know, her mom's side of the familia. And then on her father's side, well, they're from Tierra Maria, from, you know, La Puente, New Mexico, and some of those smaller villages. And, you know, she, she had always reflected on that when she left to California, and that she would be singing in the calles of San Francisco, that there would be these older viejitas mexicanas that would come up to her llorando and say, esta canción, este corrido, es de mi pueblo, de México. And just when we think of the, the global experience of how, whether that's from New Zealand or as close as Albuquerque to as far as San Francisco, California, that it could even just be a canción that will merge and be the bridge for our, for our plebe, 
for people and how we can even find, you know, relatedness and some of our brothers and sisters from Mexico and the toda parte del mundo, no? And so it's it's a very beautiful um, experience in which sometimes even our our poetry, our our dichos and our corridos can can take us to those places. I think there was somebody that had their hand raised over here. I want to say something real quickly, guys. When somebody asked a question, we do need you guys to repeat the question so we can hear what it is. It's a frame of mind, it's a frame of heart, no? Uh, cultura, and to be referred to as a manito, first of all, they're, called, they're referring to you as a brother, as an hermanito. So what an honor to be considered an hermano or an hermana, no matter where you go. I, I also thank you, Trisha, for actually sharing a little bit about your work and the inspiration that you had and where um, there are two projects and they are merged um, uh, around a similar um, interest. There's a Manitos Trail and then there's a Manitos Community Memory Project, which and Trisha's involved in both. And so it, it's really important. But I, if I'm perceiving your question, it's something that we grappled with a little bit or a lot in the Manitos Community Memory Project. 
as we started to think about um, first, where does it end? Like, I, typically, I think a lot of scholars thought of it ending like in Espanola, maybe, right? Or maybe Santa Fe. And and then I had a conversation with, you know, some way of Cisneros. He's a, he, his family is originally from Belen. He said, we're not manitos. We're, that's you guys up north. That's not us. And I'm like, but it's the same experience. We're sharing similar foods, right? And I kept wanting to push the border. I actually, I'm always trying to break down these borders because they're artificial and we create them for different reasons. But it, it is, Levi just said, maybe it is a frame of mind. You know, so, so I, I'm actually more interested in where the commonalities, right? And where I, I'm just interested in where were those points of intersection? Even if you're not Manito, whether you're recognizing it yourself or someone else is recognizing it, where are the commonalities, right? Do you guys eat chicos? Do you, I mean, the, the, those things, like certain things that connect us, <laughs> that we think make us Manitos, right? Yeah, but do you guys eat lamb this way? Or do you, you, you know, and, and it's not so much about gatekeeping or creating those borders. It's about finding where we intersect and where we can actually make those connections. That's what I'm interested in. I think Olivia mentioned something that really caught my attention. And you use the word that I now slip from my head in terms of um, it, it's different than empathy, but how we start to see ourselves reflected in other people's experiences. Those of us who want, I forget the word that you used, but it was, do you remember? Um, <laughs> but, but it was, yeah, you mentioned Mexico. And as I was thinking about, you know, here's a reality historically. We like to think of ourselves as isolated up here. But the reality is, is we've always been a convergence of cultures. The, the Quintanas who end up all over our landscape, including in, here in towns. The original Quintana came from Mexico City, right? And so for me, that, like the fact that you were just in Mexico, it, it, like there's so many of our my, the migrations of our ancestors, they came from other, right? The, and we discount those migrations and we shouldn't. And, and we really have to think about how that started to shape our sense of identity, whether it was in those 1700s, whether it was 2,300 years ago, whether it was the 1930s, that as we start to think about identity, I think of one of my favorite writers, Eduardo Galeano, who says that we are not a museum piece sitting stock still under a piece of glass. We are the endlessly astonishing synthesis of the contradictions that say, so I'm now paraphrasing him, but the contradictions, and I think of the contradictions not negative, but contra decir, counter sayings of who we are. And that's, that to me is who we are as identity. It's these special things that we think of as manitoness, but it also, I hope it creates the empathy to create um, uh, uh, understanding of other places as well. Yes, sir. I'm 
Yeah, well, one of the first questions that somebody will ask you when they meet you is, ¿Cómo te amas? And then, ¿De qué familia eres? No? Who's your family? And you're identified by who your family is. And that goes back generations and generations. I guess I'm going to read a poem. <laughs> when I don't know what to say, I just read poems. <laughs> and you say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As a young child, I was told that the spirit of my relatives would visit me in flights of golden swallowtails. Every summer as I haul wood, I encounter them, dancing between the aspen and along the riverbanks. As I hunt, prone, with my elbow deep in the earth, I am surrounded by lush meadows of red top grasses and watch them cling to the salvia. They drink the memories of Bear Mountain milkweed and dream in the rabbit brush, patron of our crops and medicines, as long as we continue to farm. Trust that the rain will come if we just keep planting. Soy del Valle Sagrado de Taos, but my blood journey commences at the headwaters of the Rio Bravo, trickles from the Costilla Creek, settles along the Rio de Ciro, Canadian, then is freed in Mexico. Las tierras santas son los lugares donde el agua se juntan con otras aguas. But you see, my family has never agreed. Like my water, I can only manifest its precious flow from my eyes the moment my family emptied my cup in order for a stranger to drink. Mariposa, llévame al tanque, where my family sent five piones, three donkeys, and four horses to help with construction. The ledger for the Acequia del Monte depicts the beautiful history of communal sweat and cooperation to store water in times of drought. Recuerdas que había tanta agua en la Acequia que a veces las truchas brincaban los bordos y nadaban entre los campos de alfalfa? There was a time when my family planted fields of corn, squash, and potatoes, their homes built alongside one another. I can hear the small gate rattle in the wind just a few yards from Grandma's house, where she was making frijoles and chile colorado. Pero ahora, todas las casas de adobe se han caído. Ellos no se juntan, ellos vendieron todo y sus hijos fueron empujados así afuera con sueños quebrados. Pero de cada casa caída, todos hacen leña. Somos los hijos de la llorona, marqueados, who tag the walls of the next door that comes into Taos, breaking and entering, overdosing, bulldozing our town. Can you hear the cries of echoes through jail cells, the mumbles and gasps at the back of the church? We are the hunting wind and the swarms of crickets that seized our town and shredded our fields, leaving nothing behind and nothing more to pursue. Dicen que me van a quitar las barreras por donde ando. Las barreras me quitarán, pero mi querencia, cuando? My people, my people have always believed that water could cure anything. We store our faith, fallow land, and be the path itself for their children to return home. Home is in the smiles of my elders and in the success of my brown sisters. It is in the stories of what once was and will be again. Toma mi agua. Toma mi tierra, pero nunca podrás quitarme espíritu de mi patria. No riego, pero canto de mi herencia. The carcass 
of a tiger swallow tail rests in a glass oval tower on my altar. I found it dead on my father's doorstep the last time I journeyed home. It is a relic of my grief and simplicity of the water that gives us life. There is no such thing as death, just the journey of all of us golden swallow tails seeking the deepest of blue of the water. Toda casa taila, todos hacen leña. That's beautiful, which is the play on uh, the palo taigo de los hacen. And then the other one is no lloro, pero me acuerdo. It was very good. It was really good. Only Trisha can write. Sorry about that. So, uh, I was uh, just commenting on the two lines that Sandra had written. Sorry about that. So, I was just commenting on the two lines that stood out for me, uh, which was de toda casa taila, todos hacen leña. Uh, that is so beautiful. Right from a fallen house, everybody will make wood out of it. And then the other one is no lloro pero canto de mi querencia, which is like where we're at now too. You know, um, no lloro pero me acuerdo. Pero you've taken that. What is the name of that song? Um, Pero canto de mi querencia. Pero canto de mi querencia. Pero canto de mi querencia. I no longer irrigate, but I sing of my energies. We have a Zoom audience on there. You do. Do we have questions from <laughs> them? I love that. Um, how has religion or spiritual traditions informed your tenencia? How has religion or spiritual traditions informed your tenencia? Well, that was one of the questions. Yeah, one of the things that I, in my early studies uh, to Wyoming was, in fact, the religious icons that I was looking for. Uh, that were the same religious icons that you find here in people's homes in North New Mexico, the same religious traditions in terms of Catholicism, for example, and the reverence for the Virgin de Guadalupe or Nuestra Señora Santa Maria, right? More of a Northern New Mexico, uh, uh, you know, the La Virgen de Guadalupe. Religion definitely is part of this rituals, the oraciones, um, the uh, moradas existing um, along the southern Colorado border. I've not been able to identify any moradas beyond southern Colorado, you know, to the Dodds at least. I did hear that there had been a morada once in Denver, but I've not been able to, uh, to identify any other beyond several gentlemen had been at Manos when they were here in New Mexico uh, in their youth, and then when they moved on to Wyoming and Colorado, they still identified as at Manos even though they were no longer in practice. It's a great question. Um, and it makes me think of three things. If I can just keep them in my head right now, it, it makes me think um, of. Uh, makes me think of, of the fact that we often think that the spiritual traditions are only Catholic, right? Um, I think of my tia, uh, my great aunt Lupita, she was Mandonado, they were from Cuesta and Cerro, and they became Pentecostal. And they moved their entire family to California. Um, and so it, I, I don't know this, but I wondered if they left because they were leaving a family in a community that had become so Catholic, that was so Catholic, right? That, that however they became Pentecostal, they were also wanting to make a sense of community in a space that they felt comfortable. I, I wonder those things, right? Just because I, I'm, um, I was raised by a man whose family became Presbyterian, and then he became agnostic, I think. And my mother, who raised us deeply Catholic, and I think that being raised that way, it made me empathetic to understand different religions, right? Or people who actually don't even believe them. Um, 
So that's the first thing that makes me think of that, that like, um, I don't have the answer to the question, but so many migrations um, may have been a result of the fact that they were other things, or maybe they became other religions in these other spaces. The second thing is that Levi just made me think of, um, I have cousins the, uh, that, that end up coming every single year all the way from Wyoming, which isn't that far, right? For sure, it's not. It's six, hours. six hours. No, it's not. And they come every year to the Morada there in Garcia, uh, Colorado, and right in Costilla, that, that, that it's important for them to continually connect. Um, and the third thing um, that it made me think of is, um, I'm not going to read it, but it's a poem I've written about bendición, like the, the fact that my mother, whenever I went in El Camino, right, she would always bless me with her bendición. Um, and I, let me just read the, not so much the poem, but, but um, you want me to read just a little bit? It's incomplete, but... Um, <laughs> Um, no, no poems ever. La bendición, and it's one that she always said, Virgen de la Encarnación. A prayer trembling in her eyes, falling onto her lips. Madre del Verbo Divino. A prayer trembling across on her swollen fingertips. Echa de tu bendición. A prayer trembling on my brow, wet with her touch. Y guíalo por buen camino. A prayer trembling and falling on these two shoulders down this road. Second part of this poem is called Prodigal Steps. At her crossing, she recalls a blessed mother whose son, falling and rising, turned to a brother, calling mother to her son and son to his mother, as my rise would call my brother into her arms. I was the one who wouldn't be the prodigal, and I so became who of her two sons should be the one to stay, to remain here for a mother without a daughter. And each one of them has its own cemetery. Yeah. <laughs> it could also be a form of intolerance where you don't find tolerance in one church, you go find it somewhere else. This uh, migration of what you were talking about is interesting and it continues to the day. I mean, for different factors, but um, it reminds me of my good friend from Barito, Juan Romero, who happens to be now a Pentecostal minister in Greeley, Colorado. And he says there's a whole community of people uh, in Greeley. So it's a place I'd like to go visit and document those stories. And the last thing I want to say about spirituality is, you know, I grew up Catholic here in Taos, but the closest I have ever been to the earth, into my cultura, into, you know, my traditions is when I slip on my buckskin every, you know, January for the for the Comanches and for the Lanzantes. I also danced, you know, Chichimeca when I was in Albuquerque, and I was a pretty, um, you know, devout farmer there in the South Valley and the Mexicanos really had embraced me in that community too. And I remember when I went to the Yaqui reservation for the Iquanon ceremony, they loved the Chicanos. I mean, they were, you know, somos uno, we are one people. And they would come to us and they had the same dances and we spoke Spanish and we ate the same food and we prayed together and it was, it was incredible and the buffalo dancers came out and the deer dancers from Tucson and you know we all had our plumas and we all you know I wouldn't say there was like tolerance I would say there was like harmony 
and it was powerful and so i just want to like bring that forward too and say that like our indigenous grandmothers who stayed here and preserved and raised the babies and kept the language and like we can't forget those songs and those prayers too and that spirituality that has been in this valley since time and memorial There is a woman who we met, um, we were doing a presentation in Laramie um, for an exhibit that we had there that was in the audience whose family was from New Mexico, but she had never lived here. She was born and raised in, in, in Wyoming, but she considered New Mexico to be another part of her cadencia too. And so the title of my essay in, in the anthology, in this anthology here, uh, is a tale of two cadencias, which is about that you can actually play more than one, uh, just as that woman did. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, before this ends, I wanted to express that it's very inspirational to draw from this well of experience and knowledge that the three of you have. It happened every day, so I wanted to express my inspiration to them. And I wanted to uh, say that as far as the Manito Trail, uh, in my own mind, uh, when I left the house for 30 years before I came back, I lived in Washington, D.C. for six years. I worked for Senator Bingaman, and uh, I volunteered to take people from New Mexico through the capital to give them tours uh, through the capital. And uh, it was a very interesting experience because after being gone from New Mexico, I was able to uh, identify any one from New Mexico just by the accent of their English or their Spanish and uh, uh, just a couple of times I, I was referred to as a manito my the hill who was a poet from from San Cristobal and, uh, and, it, and and I don't know how some of these people ended up in Washington DC I don't know maybe it was a kind of cultural exchange program or something like that but it was a whole group of uh, people and anyone that came from New Mexico, it was really fun. And even the Anglo um, accents from New Mexico were identifiable, <laughs> even if they came from Clovis or somewhere. And uh, so to me, the Manito Trail is worldwide. And then that was confirmed by my, my nephew who taught English in Hong Kong. The Chinese people, and uh, and he said that he ran into people there from New Mexico, and uh, and I said, okay, that's it. They're everywhere: <laughs> New Zealand, Hong Kong, of course, Washington D.C., our own capital. But to me, the Manito Trail uh, is worldwide, and uh, and recognizable because I would hear the words from my grandparents, and and and. In those days, it wasn't intellectualized the way to right here at this discussion, but it was uh, an expression of grieving uh, with kindness and with uh, brotherhood and love for the people that they would refer to as a manito or a manita. Thank you for saying that. I think something we haven't brought up is all of our brothers and sisters who served, served in our armed forces and who had family in Hong Kong and in all parts of the world because they served our country. And, you know, I have beautiful stories from some of my even contemporary peers who served in the Navy and, and that like meeting a brother from, from another part of the world and that intercambio de la lengua and be like, oh, we're brothers and banding together, right? Because like there's that familia that we find. And so thank you for sharing that. That's, I really resonate with that. <laughs> Comments from Sylvia. These are things that Esteban raised about the Manita Manita because they are outsiders. 
And where have exiled outsiders found Manito Manita community? I knew that the minute you said Sylvia <laughs> <laughs> Sylvia, we love having you present with us, even on the computer. Um, Dr. Sylvia Rodriguez, who has actually helped us understand manitoness in the deepest levels. Um, so, where do, can you repeat that last part? Where, sure. do, um, where have exiled outside the Manito Manito community? Where have they found Manito community? I, it, there are different ways to interpret that. And I think about the way we make family in different ways, um, in different spaces, whether we're, um, I, uh, whether we're exiled and living and working in places like Washington, D.C., um, or other spaces that, that we, we create a sense of community um, by often breaking bread. Um, and and we create those spaces, but sometimes they're with other people who are not money for money. But we make our own families, sometimes necessarily so, right? Um, or I I immediately think um, what it means to be LGBTQ in these small villages as well, and how hard it is mm -hmm. um, to be LGBTQ in, in, in these communities which isn't always accepted um that may not be what dr rodriguez is talking about but it's immediately where my mind goes and how i have had to navigate those issues um in our communities and in our own families and how sometimes we make our own family outside of those spaces necessarily so to actually feel comfortable and how even like articulating that right now as a 53 year old man still makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, but how important it is to still be able to articulate that, that it, it's important for us to acknowledge that we have such diversity in our communities and our families and why it's so important to create moments of empathy and acceptance as well. <laughs> I think um, I'd like to wrap it up if it's okay with everybody. It's been an amazing platica, and I'm glad that we were able to get the audience to participate in this platica, both here and um, so too as well. Uh, Olivia has asked me to, to read a poem in closing. Uh, and, uh, really, it's, it's, a, it's a poem that pays off homage to the villages where we come from, but also in our staying and in our leaving. No? It's called A Poetry of Remembrance. A Poetry of Remembrance. It may be the sky, its evening color just north of the horizon lifting in whispers of apricot, lavender, and periwinkle. Or it may be the way the old rusted car's rooftop smudge into the solemn landscape's drifting light, heart wheeling across the alfalfa field towards a full moon. I am sure it is that this evening for us to gather our bags and continue on. Even though we have garnished what we can and like a grandmother's measure, take with us no more and no less. Here, aquí, en este pueblo, en este valle, en esta vecindad, it is a poetry of remembrance and of an honoring of land and people. Earth songs, love poems, born of celebration and mourning. In the place where I come from, también de gusto se llora, como de tristeza se canta. And under that colorful backdrop of a spring dust framing the village, there are sad stories that bind us in our comings. There are joyful stories that bind us in our goings. 
At times we see a finality of a way of life no longer, but we carry in our hearts a memory time the anciano speak through the poetry and the song and the rhythm of their stories. And we take their stories and we form ours to theirs and we lament the tongue recalling the sound of its native language how we carry it with us into this our other world lamenting the spirit of the heart which will cry out to no one's hearing and we take the forewarning of the elders our tios and our tias our primos and our primas and we'll remember we'll remember we will remember and we'll laugh and join in the circle of our brethren in that vast periphery hollow and echoing remembering us home because we are still alive and we'll rejoice and feast in the clumsiness of our faith and we'll dance around the open fire stepping out into the next tomorrow because we're still alive manitos and manitas we are still alive or maybe it's simply the thump of the trunk lid as it is shut the one more final goodbye having been said the family dog gone wagging its way back under the old retired family sedan venus already twinkling it may be that this evening which makes it difficult for us to gather ourselves and continue on Muchas gracias, uh, Esteban y Olivia uh, and Levi. Thank you so much for bringing all of this together um, and the project. Just in general, thank you so much for starting this project for all of you. I just, it's really beautiful to see how you all are paying this forward. Um, but looking back at the same time, and uh, it's a really special moment to bring these stories together. So muchas gracias. Um, and I also wanted to ask of the audience today. Um, if you all would 